Lord Jesus, we want you here. And we are ready to receive what you have for us. God, would you speak to us in our seeking, in our doubt, in our waiting, in our restlessness, in our hope, in our joy? Would you receive us where we are? Would you make contact with us? Would you open up your words that we may hear from you, that we may see you, we may know you, we may love you? You alone can do this. We're here ready and waiting. And whatever bears and boundaries, would you leap over them? And would you seize us at the core? In Jesus' name, amen. So a few years ago, there was not a religion course at Camosun College. It's a two-year college in Victoria. And uh, somebody, an administrator, spoke to all the teachers, and they said, hey, look, we've got all these requests for a religion class. Who wants to teach it? And the history prof, he said, well, I'll do it. And there was instantly a backlist of two classes. So there's pretty strong interest in religion these days. And now he's expanded it. So now there's two different religions, East and West, or Abrahamic and Eastern religions. And now he's going into a third class. And this is what's on everybody's mind these days. Apocalypse. Everyone wants to talk about the end of the world. It's fascinating to all sorts of people. See, it used to be for a while there that because of the scientific revolution and technological revolution, everyone was just really optimistic about the future. They said, this is going to be great. We can have heaven on earth, basically. There's so many good things going on. But something's shifted in the last 10 years or so. There's a lot more alarmism, catastrophe. There's fires, floods. People are worried about solar flares, EMPs just shorting out. Uh, yeah, you're a fan of that, Megan? Yeah. Go, go EMPs, yeah. Oh, wait, oh, sorry, Laura. Yeah. Solar flares, disease? Do we get it? No, nothing. Overpopulation, underpopulation, zombies. Everyone's scared. We're all fascinated. What's coming next? And I'll tell you what, most of us here in Victoria are a little more protected than most people throughout the world. So we get it even less. And still, there is high anxiety, what's going to happen? No control over mortgage rates, no control over food prices. There's just so many things. How are we going to afford rent? Is there enough houses? All of it. So people are really thinking about apocalypse, which means the end of days. What's the next thing to come, the next phase? Well, in the Christian tradition, this comes from Jesus himself. In fact, the followers of Jesus who were going on preaching about it, this is in the book of Acts. I think I believe it's Peter here. He says, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he, Jesus, is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. See, if you've heard sermons before, that's probably not top of the list. But here, Peter is saying this is what he's commanded us to preach, that he is the one to judge. He is going to evaluate all things in the end. But let's hear it from Jesus himself. We'll walk through a couple of his scriptures here. This is in John chapter 15. He says, Truly, truly, amen, amen, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Now the Son of God, he's speaking of himself here. Son of God actually ties into um, the promise in the Old Testament of a king to come, who's a king like a son to me, says God. He makes this promise to King David. But it's elevated. So this son or this Messiah, those who hear his voice will live, says Jesus. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. This is a very mysterious part of it. That God alone holds the life of all things. 
but here is Jesus as well. He's elevated. And Jesus says, the Father has given this one authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Now this is a little confusing, but Son of Man actually refers to one who is coming down from the heaven with the appearance as of a Son of Man. That's a prophecy in Daniel. So it's actually more of a divine agent. So Jesus here is tying into both these prophetic streams, both these promises, and linking them to himself. Do not marvel at this, he says, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, and they will come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Like, honestly, if there was a Christian spinoff to The Walking Dead, this would be it. Right? This is like, just let it capture your imagination for a second. This is saying there's a resurrection of all people, not just the good people, but all people going to be brought into account, brought into relationship with this one. And Jesus says, it's him. Honestly, you can't read this stuff without thinking he's a narcissist unless he is the one he says he is. These are crazy claims. Okay, let's skip to Matthew. This is another one of the biographies. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another. This is Jesus saying of himself, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Now, some of you may have heard this. It's kind of an extended saying here. Um, and I hate to say it, but goats are not the good ones. In, in this culture, in this parable, in this telling, the sheep are the good ones, and the goats get cast away. And the measure by which they are cast away, received, or removed is whether they attended to the stranger, he says, clothed the naked, visited the sick, and came to those imprisoned. Which as I was rehearsing this today, I thought that's very strange. So when he comes to bring justice, even then he is concerned with people who were sentenced, at least some of them justly. Some of them are bad people who have done bad things, stolen, raped, murdered. But even then, the measure by which he will evaluate is love and care. He is merciful, even as he judges. I hear from Luke. Be careful, be careful, he says, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life, which is not the third thing I would have put in there. I might have put orgies or something. <laughs> that's elsewhere. I'm not just made, it's not just coming off the top of my head. That's elsewhere in the Bible. I wouldn't have thought anxieties of life there are paired with carousing and merrymaking and drunkenness. Just be careful that you do not get weighed down by these things. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. It's coming quick. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on watch, he says. And pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. And that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. I have a few things to note here. This is pretty severe. This is kind of awakening. The consequences of human badness are severe. You don't even have to be a Christian or a theist to believe that right now. We're seeing it all over, marked on our planet, with people all over the place. It is not a good situation. And yes, there's some goodness and glory in the rest. But the consequences are severe. And there's a couple responses just built into this section that Jesus says. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down. One response is giving yourself over to escape. Merrymaking, 
drunkenness, Fortnite, whatever, Netflix, running, whatever it is, giving yourself over to escape so you just don't have to think about it. That's a lot of our reactions, isn't it, to our anxieties, to the state of the world? I'll just forget it. So that's one response, is escape. The other response is getting weighed down with the anxieties of life. Checking stocks every single day. When are the housing prices going down? How's crypto doing? Are we gonna have enough toilet paper? Right, it's the hoarding instinct. It's the worry, it's the focus on the lack. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? That's one way that weighs us down. And Jesus here is concerned not about how you will stand on your own two feet, you and those with you. He's not concerned about that. He's concerned about how you will stand before him. That you be, may be able to stand before the Son of Man, he says. We too strongly bias me and mine, but Jesus keeps in mind the whole human family and the whole of time. That's what he's concerned about. Now this picture of justice would be similar to what the Jewish people would have expected, somewhat. A warrior king who comes in power, we even read about it in the psalm. But there are two major surprises here with the coming of Jesus. He exercised first, he comes as a baby through a womb and exercises power through humility even unto death. That is a complete surprise. And that's the glory of Easter or the incarnation leading to Easter, Christmas to Easter. But that he comes again might have been expected, but that his judgment would include them as well. Not just the Romans, the captors, but them as well. It's inclusive, it's expansive, it's cosmic. And that it would be Jesus himself who holds the keys to life and death. That is his claim. That is shocking. It was shocking then, it is shocking now. I hear this bit from Luke, just earlier from the last section. He says, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars... This is kind of um, the rulers of the earth were seen in kind of celestial, heavenly terms. So there's a shift of powers. On the earth, nations will be in anguish, perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And at that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things happen to take place, he says, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is coming near. Clouds were seen as as kind of introducing a victor into a city. They're kind of a middle way between the abode of humanity on earth and the abode of God in the heavens. So the clouds were this meeting place where you welcome the king into the kingdom. It was not just being lifted up into the sky. But see here how two different responses to judgment. Not all judgment is bad. Sometimes you want to be judged. You get the A. You won the contest. Fantastic. People are well pleased with you. You did a great job. Or you're in court. You have some grievance. There's some injustice done. You seek justice. You want judgment. The verdict went in your favor. Thank you. That's a good judgment. We just don't want the bad judgment. That's what it comes with. There's these two responses. Faint from terror and stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is near. Pretty drastic responses. I felt a tremendous ease thinking about this today, even though normally when we've talked about judgment and justice, I we feel a little uneasy about it and almost want to apologize for it. But I think there's, and there's good reason for it, because when we talk about judgment, it feels so, I don't know, judgy. 
Who are we to judge? Like, that's, our, that's some of our nervousness. Yeah, that's exactly right, which is why we need a judge, a good and perfect judge who knows the secrets of all our hearts, who can sort out intentions and motives and impact every factor and outcome. That's who we want as our judge, isn't it? We want justice, but only if there's a just judge. So yes for justice. And Jesus as judge cannot be bribed. There are no conflicts of interest. He owns no stock in any company. His friends span the globe. Every tribe, every nation, every color, rich and poor. If anyone can be trusted as just, as a judge, it is God and Jesus. This is enough. This is what we want to keep focused on. Don't get lost in the details. I know you're trying to figure out what the end of time looks like. When the zombies will rise. The signs. It even says that in Luke. This was a big focus in my 20s is trying to figure this out. My dad got kicked out of a church, well, he tells me, because his church preached on this rapture that all the Christians were going to be caught up in the heavens and then all the atheists and the bad people would be left on the earth. Okay, he didn't see that in the Bible, so he approached the pastor. There was some conflict. He got kicked out. That's how he tells it, or that's how I remember him telling it. So this is deep in my family history. And so in my young 20s, well, most of my 20s, I explored this comprehensively. I traveled through 42 states in my grade, my fourth year university. Took the fall off. This was on everyone's mind in the U.S. But everyone had different signs, things that... that, that they took the most confusing parts of the Bible and said, this is what's happening. And I thought, this is reckless, maybe. And once you all figure it out, let me know. That's what I thought. Side note, there was some fun companies that started up as a result of this. For example, some atheists started up a pet-sitting business for those who were swept away in the rapture. <laughs> if you want to get something for your friends or family. Here's the big picture. When you think of justice and judgment, you're just thinking about people getting cast out, body counts and the rest. But here's the picture that is told us and explored and described in the creed as we've been going through. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. The revelation of God before Almighty and powerful is as Father, as is a parent is relational, who is creator of all things. And I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son, who is made of the same stuff as the Father, who for us and for our salvation was made man. For us and for our salvation. This is relational. To free us to love. That is why he comes. To love us that we may love. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead because he is opposed to all that is not love. And he is for all that is love. That's what we want of our justice system. For friends and family, that's what we want. It's what I want of my God. Now, a couple of responses, and then we're done. I thought about using a parable of Jesus here, but I thought instead I would use something a little relatable for all of us. So just imagine in your head a scenario where you're younger, say you're in high school, and your parents go away on a week's vacation. Now let's make it a month. We'll make it a month's vacation. There's a few possible scenarios, I thought. Because this, they, they're there, and then they're not, but then there's a promise to come. So you see the parallel. A few possible responses. One is so many movies. Come on over, we're having a big party. The parents are gone. And they make an absolute mess. The police are called. It's a, it's a cold gong show. You've seen this movie so many times. Then you get a call. And they're like, oh, we cut our trip early. We miss you so much. We're coming back. We'll be there in two hours. Now that is the terror. The carousing and the terror. You see that? We can all relate to that. And you blush. 
So what is the response if you're feeling that instinct? If you're like, if I met God, that might not go well for me. That would be terrifying. The nice thing is, built into the Christian story is forgiveness and mercy, so make it right. That's probably, if you're in high school and your parents go away for a month and that happens to you, just admit it when they make that call. Say, I'm coming back, I'll see you in two hours. Dad, Mom, by the way, it's a bit of a mess here. I may have had a party. We may have got a ticket for drunken disorderliness. I don't know, you're going to say it. And they're going to say in this parallel, we know because we had nanny cams all over the house. (laughs) So you might as well just admit it. This is what it is with God. You're scared? You don't know the status of the relationship? Make it right. He is eager. It is his property to always have mercy, as it says in the liturgy. Now, another response. Restlessness. Preoccupied by what you don't have. You love your parents. They're gone. You're nervous. They're, how do I make meals? What's going to happen? I miss them so much. I need them in person now. But what about their letters? They send you postcards. They're just a call away. Yes, it's not in the person. Yes, that would be better. But it's not like they're dead. It's not like there's no contact. And this is the Christian life. We get anxious. Where is God? Well, there's all these means by which we can still have contact. Restlessness. There's also the response. It's just to go cold. They seem so far away. Dealing with the distance is to withdraw and to go dark. I just don't, this just doesn't feel like he's close enough or they're near enough. That's probably what I'd do. Just kind of huddle off in a corner, nurse my anxieties, or just feel bad about myself, but they are not dead in this scenario. Another response is anticipation. You're like, I love my parents. They're amazing. I'm going to get the house all ready. I'm going to do whatever I can. I'm going to keep busy. I'm going to tell stories at the time. They did this or that. They're hilarious. And you go, how can I be useful in the meantime? Then they tell the siblings the tale of the parents. They say, gather around the campfire, kids. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you some tales. And they sing songs. You you see this metaphor starting to really break down. (laughs) But you see where I'm going, don't you? This is what we're doing now. We expect, we anticipate that he will come more fully, but many of us know the warmth and the love of Jesus in some form. And if each of us is a match, as somebody said, when we gather, we are a fire. And that's what we're doing. We're singing, we're remembering, we're anticipating, we're hoping together. And we want him to come to make things right and to feel the warmth of his love and to be finally transformed into his glory. God, hear our longing, hear our hearts. How would you meet us in the shadows and the anxieties? Would you call us beyond the distractions? That we may see the world as it really is, sometimes terrifying and dark and lonely and brutal, but also and more obviously see your goodness and your graciousness and your glory and a hope that overcomes We need this from you, and we pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen.